Is that warm enough for you? No. <laughs> it's nice and toasty in the sun though. These stones need to heat up a lot faster. Yeah, I guess like in the at afternoon. At the end of the day. We should have done this at the end of the day. Yeah, but we're going to be working on the meadow house. All right, guys. So uh, we're going to do a recap video for you. It's, a, it's going to be, it's the end of the year. And we figured, you know, we've been here for now just over two years, which is pretty amazing because it took us two years to actually find this place. So Sondra and I are going to do a recap. But before we do that, I think it's good to just... Um, frame up, like Sonder is the only one of us who's here full time. I'm here half of the time right now. Joey's almost never here at this point because uh, he was abroad for the first two years. So, and we all work different jobs. So it's not just working here at the homestead. So we're not on the homestead full time working. So I just wanted to frame that up for you because if you're not familiar with us or the, the channel, you might say, oh, well, do you all live there? Why don't you have animals? One of the reasons why we don't have animals is because you really want animals. I really you got to be animals. here. I got to be here full time. It wouldn't be fair for you who are here. Um, it wouldn't be fair to the animals. So until that happens, uh, we're not going to go full throttle on that. But we thought uh, we could summarize some of the things that we've been able to accomplish in two years for maybe that's interesting to folks who haven't been following along on the channel. Yeah, it's a lot of videos and they're all very long. So this will just be the highlight reel, I guess. Yeah. All the things that happened here in the last two years. Yeah, and I think um, one of the things that was really helpful for us, we didn't really know how we were going to utilize the land. Um, and we haven't really utilized the, the full enchilada. It's close, close to 90 acres here, but we've really only been kind of working on about, I would say roughly 15 acres that we're really kind of pushing Yeah, into. it's the cleared out area. Yeah. The rest is forest. The rest is like forest and we started to kind of like mosey into the forest here and there, but we've really concentrated on the land that's around what we call the common house and the pre-existing buildings. And one of the things that really benefited us is that this was a working plant nursery. It was a container nursery before we got here. Uh, the folks who had lived here only lived here part time. So they kind of closed up the nursery in the winter and they went elsewhere. Uh, but there was pre-existing infrastructure here, which I think really helped us. I mean, wouldn't you yeah, agree? Yeah, I would say that, you know, if we didn't have that, we would be three years behind at least to get to where we are, you know, right now. Yeah. Or where we, where we were when we got the property. That being said, a lot of folks had talked to us and said, oh, well, you know, renovating things is a lot longer and a lot harder than just actually building things from scratch. But that might have not been the case because through the pandemic and all the supply chain shortages, we f found it to be actually probably really difficult to actually find, you know, some, some products and get them on time, right? Yeah, well, the argument is like, if you build new, you could just go quickly. You don't have to deal with the stuff that's already there. We're not doing that many crazy renovations. We're not like changing too much. So I would say it's, it still takes a lot of time. We're working with a lot of the pre-existing structures and sonder has been really good at taking a look at some of the items and saying, what can we actually upcycle or recycle? And what really ends up being trash? We want to try to reduce yeah. the trash as much, as much as possible. To here. me, it's almost more interesting to do a renovation coming at this new because I'm able to see how things were built. Then I'm able to analyze and say, okay, well, how can it be done better based on what we can do today? Cause this house was built 30 years ago. And then another thing is like, I like to work with something that's already there and modify it versus starting with like an empty canvas and like having to come up with everything. Yeah. from scratch. Yeah, and I think two things really come to mind after you say things like that, because when we got here, we didn't really know how we were going to utilize every aspect of the land. And the area that's down below, which now con contains like what we call the meadow house, which was previously a, a nursery office, a seasonal nursery office and, and the barn, that area was like kind of, we were just like, oh, we won't get to that. But so it kind of surprised us that when we changed our minds and we said, actually, we are going to renovate that area. And we're so happy that we did. Yeah, and part of the reason was because that was like, that house was smaller, so we can get our feet wet, get a sense of what this will be like, and then... And it wasn't a house, actually, it was a nursery. It wasn't a house, yeah, yeah it didn't have heat, 
because it was a seasonal office. And when I look at the property, I can't think of it in these separate sections. Everything is one thing. So that's kind of the thing that needed to be done first. So that's where we started. Yeah, and that was really good because a lot of the, our friends and family had said, you know, you really want to sink your teeth into something that's smaller, just so you could get your feet wet and you know experience what it is like to actually renovate something and make mistakes along the way and not feel bad about it. That's cool that we like kind of decided to do that. And then as we started to like look at the land and the way that you were saying. We started taking drone shots and map out specific areas about how we'd actually utilize them. And of course, that's like really difficult for us to do when you're not on the land and you haven't been here for some time. But now that we've been here for some time and we walk it and we experience it and we immerse ourselves in it every day, mapping it out and then being able to execute on that map has been extremely helpful. So we've basically mapped out zones and we figure out like this is how we're going to utilize them now and into the into the future. And of course, that might change. I think it's important to be malleable with that as well. I, we could probably start on stuff. I mean, it's probably you know funny that we're actually sitting here because one of the first projects that we ever did was taking out these yep. bloated raised beds. So this is a little hill. A lot of it is. Yeah, he has a ra look at he has a raised bed here. It's filled up with weeds though. So we could actually clear all these raised beds. Look at all these are raised beds. So this is where vegetables could be planted. But Become. it's, yeah, but it's, uh, it's all built up. Like this is this can all is be all weeded, weeds. Yeah. but this could be turned into a beautiful meadow. And uh, if we go down here, you can see it just walks all the way around the perimeter of this lake. I mean, you can't even call it a pond. It's like a lake. This is kind of where it started. Cause the first thing that we did, you know, there's these, this was an overgrown area and it had these pressure treated, you know, garden beds on it. So this is some of the invasive honeysuckle that Sondra is now cutting out. Oh, I just got it in my face. <laughs> <laughs> it's starting to be more like a campfire now, huh? Yeah, I think we should get the marshmallows out. So we took all that out and this just got completed. So that's why I thought it'd be cool to film here. Although these stones are incredibly cold right now. I and I'm think just they're sitting fine. on my shoes because they're fine. The, the, yeah, it's beautiful. I love it. I love uh, stones that are just big and solid. You can stand on it, jump on it and they won't move. It's, it's really nice. And yeah, this is one of the projects that got completed yeah. slowly over time. And this was, this area, like Sandra had said, was really weedy. We had some aggressive Japanese honeysuckle no multiflora rose, I don't think here, but those are the two kind of big shrubs, invasive shrubs that were really debilitating us on this land. We had to clear a lot of that out in order to be able to, to utilize the land in the way that we wanted to. So he did a lot of the hard work uh, of actually taking out some of those large shrubs and we worked together on getting that pressure treated lumber out. Somebody had come up here recently and told us that they're there was yes irrigation but also potentially heating in those beds too yeah Did somebody say that yeah i think the old builder that um built this place he mentioned there was heating of the garden beds yeah interesting so hopefully these stones will provide some extra heat but we figured this is a a beautiful design element and this was definitely one of the more extraordinary uh costs i think that we incurred on this but i think it will uh, I mean, it's it's here to last. Well, this is the center point of where all the homes will be in the future. Right. So this, this is, is our the community. kind of place where you come together and share a story, have some food, and it's it's really in the center of the property if you think about it. Yeah. So we had to do something special here, and it is costly to bring in a bunch of stones like this, and you know you can stack it yourself. But it takes some skill to stack it in a way. I would have never been able to do it able to properly, stack it like so this. it doesn't bulge out. Yeah. So we met these stonemasons, and we ended up hiring them. Well, partly they were kind of like, 
here in their off hours and yeah. or like between jobs and slowly got it done over time. But I would say it took about a week for them to finish each each half circle. Yes. And everything is dry stacked and some of it is glued um, just like to some c uh, cinder blocks here with rebar just to make sure that it doesn't move. Uh, and the top capstones are have mortar in them so that the rain just doesn't come in and destroy the stone wall from the inside. But yeah, it it is it was a big thing, but now we have all this garden space. You get all this seating space. And we can do all kinds of cool stuff with the gazebo in the middle. Yeah. I, and I'm it's planning... perfectly placed in the land. Like from anywhere you walk or look, it, it's a great central monument to kind of look at. And Sander was very meticulous in finding that center point and seeing where the sun rises and falls through the seasons and, and to you know get it to the place that it is. And we are not finished with this yet. We still need to do some stone on the ground and finish that. We need to put some bigger stones around the edge and inside the gazebo. You know, we'd like to actually create some furniture for the inside. Uh, I'd like to grow some plants on the gazebo and use that as a trellis. I can see growing plants in some of these cracks and crevices just to increase the surface area of the garden. And, and then we need to make some stairs as well and then fill up the garden beds, which hopefully we could do before the snow really really hits hits us. We had a little dusting, but it wasn't very much. So hopefully we could uh, finish that in the next two to three weeks. But on to the next one, I think I had mentioned here, moving out the honeysuckle. I mean, how many honeysuckles and multiflora rows do you think we took out oh, at the end of the day? Oh, so many, for days. I mean, months. And you get to these different levels. Some of them you can pluck out. Others, you know, they need a little bit of, you know, with the mattock, like hit it and it will come out. Um, others, they're just completely locked in. You can't move them. So you either just cut it and then that, that's the a UTV. problem because now, yeah, or that's the in-between step. You use the UTV to either grab the stump and rip it out um, or cut it and then, then you have that stump left in the ground. And that's the hardest part, like, if you have a stump that's really big, what we end up doing is drilling a little hole and putting some poison in it to make sure it doesn't grow back at least. Yeah. And then the stump will hopefully rot away. I cut like little grooves in it so the water can get in there and decompose it, but yeah, it, it's and they, hard. And a lot of them spread by like the, these rhizomes. So you might have one here and then like 30 feet away, <laughs> you'll have this uh, another yeah. one, but it's like connected by the same route. I think every spring we got to walk through the whole land and see where they're coming up, like the small trees, because they're the first ones that set that have the leaves come out, right? Yes, the first so, and almost the last to leave them. Yeah. Every time in the spring, we should just do a circle and then, you know, you could pick them right out. But if you let them go for too long, it's going to be a nightmare to get rid of them. Yeah, we still have some beasts on this land that are kind of like on the interstitials, like towards the forest. But we pretty much took out, I would say, thousands of them and had some pretty big bonfires. Now, I've also learned that, you know, multiflora rose and Japanese honeysuckle, they could actually be great medicinals. They're used in traditional Chinese medicine. So I think we'll never get rid of all of them. So, but I don't think we need that many. Definitely not that many for medicine, but um, but we could actually then harvest some as well and not treat it as a as a total alien. But uh, that was adventurous because we had to clear out quite a lot in order to uh, prepare the old nursery area, which is about seven acres, seven to nine acres, depending on what we kind of include in it. But we basically needed to. We decided that we'd have to clean out the the whole nursery, which. Prior to us getting here, I think they took out about 64 tons of trash before we got here, which was like old greenhouse equipment, geotextile material, metal pins, things like that. Well, when we got here, it still wasn't quite clean. I think they kind of gave up on it. Which they were realizing how much work it would be to do that. So much work. <laughs> and then we just had to finish it. Because well, the problem was you can't send a tractor in there to mow anything. Because if there's metal spikes popping up, or just trash in there. You're gonna run into it with the equipment and damage the equipment. Or, you know, there might be a cinder block laying or laying in the meadow and then you come and drive it with the tractor and then it's just gonna be a mess. So you have to like, you know, filter through it, make sure there's nothing left that could harm anything and then just have a clean start. 
And I have to say, we were really out of our element with that because we went to multiple people to just try to get feedback and advice. And I think, you know, the, the person who gave us the best advice, Andy, who's one of our neighbors, was basically like, look, no one's going to want to go in here unless you take all that stuff out. <laughs> so bizarre. <laughs> I've been to California with it twice. So we decided that we'd do that and we started to even out the land. Um, we got one of our other neighbors to come in here, Brian, and actually help even out the land. But then he realized that the geotextile material, as he was trying to even out the land, was creating these big chunks. And he goes, yeah. you know what, we have to take this out, all of this out first before we even it out. So it, it, it ended up being a much bigger project. So I'm going to do just a little recap here. Uh, Brian just left back to his place because he's going to get the mini excavator because what we're finding is that we're pulling up this geotextile material which is like four to eight inches down um, underneath all the gravel bits and uh, that is ruining the grade so he's going and grading and flattening and smoothing out the land so that tractors and skid steers could come on to maintain the meadow afterwards but um, you know he's finding the geotextile material rips up the land and makes it craggy again. So he's just going to get the mini excavator to pull out the geotextile first, and then we'll go and grade the land. Yeah, it's like trying to sweep the floor, but there's a bed sheet on the floor. You just kind of like, every time you sweep, it like ripples and comes up and then it's in the way and your tractor gets stuck on that. And it's just like- I wish it was just, just a, to, a bed sheet, but it was it was a lot more than that. I mean, we still find <laughs> stuff in, in the meadow, even after all this time of cleaning up. And we, we actually walked the entire meadow back and forth. You would walk up and down, I would walk- Oh yeah, you know, we would do sideways. hours of just, finding trash and i can't believe like every time you went in there you would you would think ah everything is cleared out and the next time you walk in there it's like i found six more metal pins or you know who rat knows poison what. Or... and the amount of plant tags too and the amount of rat poison bags too yeah unbelievable it was there's still thousands like i go out there and it's really unfortunate because they use so much rat poison and it just like the wind just blows it all over the place yeah yeah so no more of that we decided after um, we did a, a round of, you know, tilling and uh, planting three rounds of green manure. And our, our neighbor Pat came and helped us do that, which was like so fortunate we found him. And then we went and seeded the meadow. We didn't seed all the seeds that we could, could do because again, it was during the pandemic and there was a massive seed shortage and we wanted seeds that were really unusual. So those are things that are not necessarily collected. We tried to get as seeds that are regional as possible, but it was challenging. So we, we seeded what we could and some of that actually came up, especially the annual stuff. So like the annual sunflowers, you know, came up pretty, pretty quickly, for instance. And we had, there was still a lot of other stuff in the seed bank. We won't know and see the full vitality of the meadow until probably year two or three, and it's really been only the first year. So that was another huge, huge project that we did. And it was yeah. right in the beginning. And the first project, because it does take so long. So you want to do the projects that take the longest to come up, like planting trees, you want to do those things first so that yeah. you'll see them in three to five years by the time everything else is done. And we also realized that if we didn't do that right away, uh, the plants would just move in because nature abhors a vacuum and then it would be that much harder and that much more work for us to actually clear the meadow out. Because when we got here, it had just stopped being a nursery like several months really before we got here, mm -hmm. I think. So it was still quite barren. Like it was basically just stone. 
And by the time we ended up uh, getting onto the land, we were surprised how much the plants had already come up. So we were like, oh, if we don't, if we don't take care of this now, you know, it's gonna be a, a mess in the future. So luckily we, we did that. And then just uh, last month, uh, I planted 3000 alliums in the meadow as well. So in addition to the seed, decided to actually plant some alliums. And we also put in an orchard up there as well, which is something yep. that we just did. Yeah, there was this perfect space close to the house for an orchard. And we made some berms, kept them straight in a straight line. So it's easy to mow, but we angled them. So it's not such a grid. And it's it creates kind of a little bit of interest. And it creates a great walking path. If you wanted to go from one place to the other, this is kind of the shortest route. So it made sense to angle them this way. And like Sander said, I think, uh, you know, planting some of those like fruit and nut trees earlier rather than later, then we'll be able to reap the benefits sooner rather than later as well. Because and then the gypsy moth came in. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, and they the took spongy a bunch moth, of them it's, it's known as oh, now. Oh, yeah. spongy moth. <laughs> and the deer. And the deer. Because we the, fixed our fence. And the emerald ash borer. Yeah. Well, that's mostly for the ash trees. But yeah. we fixed our fence, but then... After a couple months, there was one deer that made it in. Yeah. And then there's two babies. And then now there's three deer total. <laughs> well, let's step back yeah. because one of the things that we really benefited from here, because this was a, a popular plant nursery, they actually had a deer exclu exclusion fence around, I don't know, probably around 15 acres of this land so that the deer wouldn't come in. But it wasn't really, it was put in at different times by different people and some of it was more professionally done than others. And we wanted to actually expand the deer exclusion fence into the forest because we realized that there was no regeneration happening within our forest and we wanted to protect some of those trees. And then we figured, well, the deer will go on the outskirts of, of, our, of our land here. And uh, we realized the cost of actually putting in a professional fence was just extraordinary. And we kind of hemmed and hawed. We, we applied for a grant. We didn't get it. That took some time. We got some quotes. Uh, the quote earlier in the season was a lot less than what it was later in the season. Yeah, and we're still kicking just, ourselves in the pants for not accepting that first quote. <laughs> just kick it around for too long. And then it just like kind of goes up and yeah. We sometimes get... Uh, you, you know, I would say like locked up with uh, over researching things and, you know, getting too many price quotes and then, and then feeling like we can't move on something. So that's happened in a couple times, but, but we've, we've kind of learned our lessons to a certain degree. And especially now with supply chain shortages and, you know, whether there's a rail strike or this, sometimes we're just like, let's just get it and we know yeah. we're gonna use it in the future. What would have been better is like, just accept the first quote, kind of commit yourself to this company that's gonna come in and help you out, and then kind of figure out the details as you go. If there's a huge scope increase, obviously the price will go up a little bit, but just the amount of effort and time it takes to like research other comp, like just go with the, you know, not go with the first one, but like go with, you know, if it makes sense and it feels good, just go with yeah, it. Go with your gut. Go with your gut. <laughs> and it, like, you could be researching this stuff forever, but. I will say that like, we did extend some of the fence into the forest and we have the remainder of the fence. And when we're able to kind of recoup and get the time, we might actually consider trying to put in the fence posts ourselves and then maybe get in somebody professional to, <coughs> to actually string the fence. So we do have mm. some of the fencing equipment in the future. Yeah. One thing, one benefit is like, we, we were able to see how they did it. And now we also had the proper metal fence and we had a plastic temporary, 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 temporary fence. fence. Yeah. And we kind of realized that both of them are doing equally well. And the temporary fence was kind of easy to install because we didn't need any posts because there's so many trees. We did that in a couple hours. So I, instead of doing the whole fence metal, I'm actually thinking we might be better off just doing the plastic fence in the forest where there's all these hazards of trees falling on it and stuff like that. And then we can use the metal fence for the area that doesn't have forest that is also more visible. And then, you know, we have a nice fence for that, but then the rest can just be functional yeah i mean the deer. that makes a lot of sense we haven't discussed that but that makes a lot of sense 
And uh, we have to give a shout out because we got that kind of plastic trident fence is what it's called um, at Deer Busters. And we also got the, the eight foot fence, which is what you need around here for the super deer so that they don't get in uh, also from Deer Busters. So yeah. we're, good product works really well. Works really well. And we're really grateful for that. I think the next one I would highlight is just uh, we found out when we did a walk through the woods here is that we had so much of our ash trees, which was a prominent tree within our forests that were affected by emerald ash borer, which is not a native insect and it was just decimating our ash trees and we get limbs dropping off here and there. So we decided that we'd have to take those out. So we ended up taking out, I'd say somewhere between 100 and 200 trees. Would you imagine yeah, so? Yeah, just a couple of guys with a chainsaw just going at it, going at it all day, just cutting as much down as possible. And then of the ones that are dead, yeah. And that opened up the forest quite a lot to let way more light in so that other trees can grow and that we can also, you know, plant. You've planted a lot of other trees in the forest now Yeah, I've that are going to have a chance to grow. More, and they're inside the fence. So and They're inside the fence. Here. And I did more diverse planting. Like I have Circus canadensis and um, service berry, which we already had in, in there. And we have... Uh, hazelnuts, things along those lines. So I, hopefully we're gonna have a bit more diversity within our forest, which will be a bit, like it's worse when you have all the same tree and you have like a monoculture and if something hits that tree, like it did with the ashes and you don't have anything else and you don't have a forest any longer. So, you know, for us, it's about like getting in some of that diversity that probably was here at some point, but may have been taken down because you know, this was, you know, marginal grazing land area, you know, back in the day. And, um, and it was treated as such, uh, and, you know, and a lot of those big trees had been taken out, unfortunately. So we only have like a few of those left one, you know, one close to the land here, but more in the back area, which is sad because we would have loved to see some of those really big trees. And I think the woods would have been more resilient if we had those in there. So the next one I would say is that we, we ended up pruning a ton of trees. So like this had been interesting because it was a nursery and there were quite a lot of garden beds here, but a lot of them were really overgrown. They weren't taken care of over the last number of years. And you probably know that if you have garden beds and you just let it go, a lot of like weeds and other things kind of push in. Oh, 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 oh. oh it's coming. It's coming. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> So we ended up just like starting to make quite a lot of uh, garden beds, pruning like crazy. We ended up taking out a big willow tree in the front that was kind of like it with another tree. magnolia tree and it was kind of like sticking out its arms and like slapping us in the face. Um, so we kind of pushed that over into the uh, other part of the area. And we put in our first flower bed, which was that shade garden mm -hmm. area. And that yep. kind of came in two points. And do you want to talk why it came in two points? Like, Well, first of all, that pathway there desperately needed to be replaced because it was just too thin. It was overgrown. Weeds are coming through it. You could cut the weeds, but it'll grow back in a week. And the, the, the weeping white pine was just pushing out oh, into yeah. it. The trees have gotten to a size where you kind of have to walk like this <laughs> because, you know, the tree will hit you in the face. So we ended up expanding that garden bed, making it bigger, and then relocating the pathway slightly and redesigning its shape. And then with that came all these other areas that all of a sudden became defined uh, that became flower beds. It allowed me to plant more. Yeah. <laughs> and then after you were done with that one, we, we had this whole section of grass with these two trees in it. And, we, and it had this path, but you couldn't really tell the path was there because there was just grass next to it and the path was grass. So we just ended up Let's just make that whole area a garden bed too. Well, we had to dig up that area because we had to find where the septic was, first of all. Because if we're going to find out where the septic is, we're, we're gonna have to like, obviously clean out the septic. I'm gonna measure where the septic is. Okay. And so we put a top on that. We made sure that it was as part of the path. And we haven't finished the path yet, I should say. We've kind of marked it out, but 
we, we probably won't finish it until next year with laying down the stone, compacting it, and actually putting like big stone. So that's something that we'll have to do next year. All right, we're going to work on the yard today. So right here, you can see that we mowed two areas really low. Over here where the oak is and over here. And the idea is to start turning this into a planting bed. So as you approach the house, you get this large, like deep space where there's all kinds of trees and plants growing. And then over here, we're going to take the lawn up and we're gonna eventually put bulbs underneath and then plant like a low meadow so that you'll have uh, maybe four inches or so of grass and with all kinds of different flowers coming up uh, in the early, early spring, late winter. Now this is gonna stay grass, I believe. And then we're just gonna have a little section here that's also gonna be garden bed. Um, it's kind of a continuation of this curve that you see coming in here. It just crosses where I'm standing and then it jumps over to the other side and then it continues that way. So we started to take up the old pathway. Um, so and we're using the stones to define where the new edge is gonna be. So you could see that previously the path used to be from here to here. So we've given this garden bed a bit, little bit more space. So this has more room to grow. So it eventually falls over the path. And then we're making it a little bit wider all the way up to there. And then uh, here as well, we're making it wider just to have easier access. And then over here you have also this curve. And it's really tricky to figure out all these curves. You just gotta walk the paths like a hundred times. But the idea behind this curve is that when you approach the house from this angle, you wanna feel like there's just as much space here to go that way as there is space to go that way into the house. So this is kind of how I'm thinking. And then this is the center of the center uh, of these two pathways. So then as you walk in here, you can go to the right. Uh, you have this nice curve here. And then these curves kind of continue into these gardens back there. And then also this curve continues to go this way. So it's this intersection here where you feel like you don't want to take any shortcuts because the worst thing to have is that if you have a, a path that you have a curve and you actually want to walk right here. So I want to make sure that we have the paths in a place where people actually want to walk. Really what happened is that we had this wonderful opportunity to plant at first 70,000, but eventually 80,000 bulbs within our lawn. Stinson style, like in the Netherlands, like a little throwback to, to Saunders' roots of the Netherlands. And uh, we wanted to actually take up some of the lawn in the first place because it was kind of like bumpy and it was really hard for us to, to mow over. Hungry for the road all my life Thirsty for adventure all my youth Chasing all my freedoms down Liberty Avenue And every time I hear a phrase My mother used to say to me Everything happens for a reason I get the feeling I need a little taste of home, home, home Just a little taste of home I need a little taste of home, home, home I need a little taste of home Nothing like kitchen conversation Steam coming up off the stove We decided to actually put a native lawn there 
And then we did three different treatments on the different areas of lawn in order to plant 70,000 and then eventually 10,000, so it's 80,000 bulbs. And while we had Cayuga Landscape came up and actually took out some of the area that we planted our first pollinator garden and our herb garden in, and then eventually we put in a big front garden. A little taste of But it was a lot of things that were happening at once. And basically with Cayuga Landscape, we had them do quite a lot because we were actually organized enough in order to be able to do it. So they were already taking up the lawn in one area. So we're like, here, take up the lawn in this area. And that's how like a bunch of garden beds got put in relatively quickly, I would say. Anything else that they, they did? I mean, I can't, we, well, we built up a gar the garden bed back there, but it's a little bit of a weedy mess right now. Put in a lot of garden beds. It's so many garden beds. You put a lot of plants in. I hope we never run out of space to put I don't more think plants. you will. <laughs> There's lots of space. We did the memorial garden. You did that. Yeah, I know. But, you know, we, that was a special thing because mm -hmm. we got to show that to the, the owner. You know, yeah. it was the, the passing of her husband. And, and we totally... Again, I cannot reiterate this enough. We were very lucky because we were looking at a, a lot of different types of land before we got this, and some of it was raw land. And, you know, you have to pay homage to the folks who have lived here before you and those who lived before you and those who lived before you. And because there's a lot that we benefited from them taking care of and loving this land. You know, this little half lake in the back didn't, didn't exist before. That's something that they put in, so we... Yeah really benefit from that and and um and that's really wonderful and hopefully the people after us are going to benefit from the work that we do as well yeah. we're just really caretakers of a section of land you know yeah. you don't really own it it's just your opportunity and time to take care of this place properly and make it beautiful so that hopefully people in the future will take care of it again we're about halfway through of what we've done in the last two years we put in a shroom bed. It's almost taking two years to get through it. <laughs> we put in a shroom bed, but we hadn't really checked up on it. We did see some shrooms in the, in the fall, the following fall, but um, we just didn't monitor it because we started to plant in the forest and we have ideas of planting in the forest and making a little agroforestry area. Yeah, it's in there. It's going to do its thing. It's going to do its thing, and, and we really concentrated on the, the core land the first two years. Staining the house, we got deck boards. Uh, we, you put in the windows and doors. Saunders has been doing most of the renovation, and one of the things I sh will say is that the landscaping gets done a lot quicker than the renovation, and it's just that the renovation, that's not by virtue of you well, actually, being like, slow. <laughs> I actually like landscaping a lot because, and just garden work in general, because things get done relatively quickly. Even a project like this with the stone beds, it's really just two weeks to build these beds, but, yeah. you know, construction and renovation it can take months so yeah. it's interesting to do garden work because it's a lot faster but yeah a lot of things needed to happen before the next winter arrived and part of that was making sure that the paint on the house is up in order and that it doesn't damage the wood further and that we have new windows because energy efficiency matters a lot in this time and we want to make sure that first of all our house needs the least amount of energy possible. And then we want to take a look at our energy and, you know, uh, how we're going to, you know, is it going to be gas? Is it going to be electric? You know, is it going to be a wood stove? Yeah. Maybe all of them. <laughs> like, yeah, diversifying so your energy and figuring out energy efficiency and energy. Yeah, you know, we want to make, like, stuff. we want to make this property be able to run efficiently. So it doesn't take a lot of maintenance to constantly upkeep it because there is so much of it and we want to just set it up right so that you know maintenance in the future is going to be easier. And we knew we had to bite the bullet and budget for new windows and doors in the common house because quite frankly the 
the windows were past their prime. They were leaky. I mean, we'd be in there in the winter and it, we could feel the cold air coming in. And one of the things is like I had mentioned before is that the, the owners of this place previously didn't live here in the winter months. Mm -hmm. So they never really experienced it in the winter. And I have to say it was very drafty. It was very cold. Yeah. And since putting in the new windows and doors, it's, it's been a godsend. House also has a lot of surface area that's window. Yeah, like these windows true. are like five by five foot big and the doors are, you know, six foot wide by whatever the height of a door is, 80 inches or so. So there's a lot of glass in this building. So it, like if, if I were to insulate the walls better, it wouldn't make any sense because there's these huge windows that are super inefficient. So the best place to put our money as far as making the house more energy efficient was replacing the windows and doing, you know, putting a better R value in that and a better air seal around that. And that's probably where we're getting most of our, you know, money back as far as heating costs. Yeah. And yeah, it's a different story if you want to keep your house at 70 versus 55 to just kind of overwinter it. And, so. and I think especially with energy bills, the way they are, like the cost of gas uh, rising, the cost of propane, the cost of uh, electricity, if you want to put solar panels, oftentimes it, there's a huge encumbrance because it's a lot of investment up front, and then you might not get that investment back for you know 25 years. I mean, here in New York, we do have to do a little bit more research because I think that they have incentives now to well solar before panels. solar or putting any like first thing I think is just making sure you don't need the energy first. Yeah, you're right. Like it doesn't make sense to throw for us to throw a huge solar array in to power a house that's super inefficient. Yeah. And now you have to have to generate all this extra electricity to, you know, to heat something that's super inefficient. Yeah. So we first wanted to invest in making the house more energy efficient and then needing probably half the energy and then seeing how we can supplement that with maybe solar panels or something like that. And we even took out the it fireplace because it was sucking out the well, I took away the wall and the whole the whole ceiling was uninsulated. It was just a hole in the roof. And it's like no wonder it's so cold. So we we patched that up and insulated it well and now it's now it's going to save us a lot of money on energy. So in some we started on this common house with the renovations. We started on the old nursery office slash meadow house on renovations. We've gotten really far on the meadow house and we're almost there. And you've also started to work on the barn and creating a wood workshop so that we're in a better position to be able to make some of our own cupboards and things like that as well. So maybe yeah, well, you talk about that. In the winter, I need you need a place to work or to do things. I can't just be cutting wood in the living room <laughs> and then Which clean up done. the sawdust. Yeah, because like... On the kitchen. Those poor oak. T chairs that my dad got us from the auction. Yeah, they're great building tables. <laughs> but the the problem Soft is houses. like, I would go outside in the, in the garage here and work and my hands would freeze and I'd have to run back in to heat them up, painful transition period, <laughs> and then go back out to do like 15 more minutes of work. Like you just need a heated space where you could just work and make things. If you don't have that, you kind of stuck in the winter, you can't do anything. Yeah. So, so, but we're making quite a bit of progress on all of those. I think now that we've um, done a lot of the renovation on the common house on the outside, in the winter months, over the next three months, we could actually concentrate um, on the renovations on the inside of the common house. And, you know, there's some lingering things here and there in the meadow house, but it's, it's, just, yeah. about, it's just about finished. It's a lot of like little knickknacks and you things. Can just look at my pants if you want to know what we've done. So, in, let's see, we've painted the house, we've insulated the, the windows, windows <laughs> and now we're doing drywall. What's this brown? <laughs> I don't know. Lighter brown. Where was that no from? Idea. Oh, that was from the chicken coop. Oh yeah, so the chicken coop, that's another thing that I forgot. That was another thing that we uh, worked on and now it's starting as it's a storage space because I started to bring more of my stuff up from Brooklyn and now it's a storage space so and there's no chicken so th you know that's our future coop. So this is the chicken coop and the clay is still drying. We are talking about how it looks like clouds as it dries on the ceiling. It's the 15 by 15 cube 
that's limited as far as how much stuff you can purchase <laughs> from an auction. Yeah. Like I have some if it doesn't fit in that too. room, you're not buying it. You're not getting it. That's the limit of space. Tell them the grossest <laughs> part about the chicken coop. Oh, they just... It used to be an old nursery office also as well, so... They had a bathroom in there that was a little dodgy. There's just a hole in the ground, basically. And they had a vent pipe for the plumbing, but they just cut a hole in the roof. And all the rainwater from the roof would just go down that drain in the roof. And the chipmunks. And down the And the chipmunks and the mice, mice and the squirrels and shitting all over the insulation. So we took that drywall out and it was just mold back there. And we cut out all the mold, treated it, and replaced all of it, replaced the drywall. Obviously the sealed hole. the whole <laughs> hole in the roof. Um, but yeah, that's now a great little space where, you know, at some point in the future, you can have animals and it will be very protected. I put a metal screen in front of the windows. It's, it's insulated as well. So it, it, it just, stays warm it stays Quite warm. And in the summer, it stays cool. Uh, the windows are great because you reinforce them with, you change out the screens and you put the hardware cloth. And we clean them. And we clean them. Light. Now, we're not finished with it. We are going to, you know, finish off the edges and maybe, you know, create a run. Maybe we'll have a little duck house. We haven't really planned it out yet, but um, that's, you know, probably a 2023, 2024 project in, in our estimation. Then we dug a thousand foot canal. I mean, tr range, trench. Yeah. <laughs> there's something about whenever I dig a trench, the, sh the biggest rainstorm of the year just wants to come in and destroy it all. It's a Sonder Van Dyke it, it canal. Has, <laughs> it, it was the second time it happened. Oh, every time I dig a trench, it comes down like thunderstorms and crazy shit. Because yeah. I dug a trench from the workshop to the meadow yeah. house. <laughs> And right as I was like covering it up, it was like, <laughs> oh shit. And then it started just raining so hard. I've never seen it rain so hard. Well, why did you dig the trenches? For the internet cable. Exactly. So we, we buried the fiber optic internet cable. You, you dug most of the trench and then he uh, hoodwinked me, hoodwinked me. <laughs> yeah, it took about a day to pull the cable through the pipe. He told me it was I thought it was gonna be a couple hours, but it hours. was about a day that it took. And then the next day too. Because a thousand feet of cable is, and then running it through different sections with pull boxes, yeah, it's a lot. But now we have a fast and secure, solid connection versus a wireless connection that is a thousand feet away, which is a lot more reliable and yeah. faster. And then now if we do other homes here in the future, the pull boxes could be a place where we could yes. easily so now, link up to. You we really thought through this. A thousand feet out here, so now we can easily get to the other places from so, there. We don't have to go from the road again. For those of you who really want to nerd out on this, Sonder and I did a really good how-to. It was mainly Sonder. I was just there for support. Did a, a big how-to on setting up your own internet cable. And what's really nice about this land, I will say is that we don't have any overhead telephone cables or anything. Everything's underground. Right, which so is better nice. because then it's more expensive. But we, for the power cables, put them, putting them on the ground can cost a lot of money, especially a thousand feet. But luckily that was already done. But the, yeah, just having no overhead power, like it, every time there's a big windstorm, you know, the power goes out because mm -hmm. like some line somewhere on a pole gets damaged or a tree falls on it yeah. or something. So having that, and also it's quite a visual obstruction. Yeah. So you hear, you hear the electricity like going yeah, through the buzzing. power lines. It's, it could be very annoying. It's better to put it on the ground, but less accessible. It makes sense that there's a lot more, like in Europe, a lot of the power lines all go on the ground. But here it's mostly above ground on poles and it makes sense because the landscape is much more, there's much more hills. There's obviously a lot of rocks in the ground. You can't just like dig through a rock and put a power cable in. Yeah. It's a lot more difficult and cost and the distances are larger. So yeah. We planted the interstitial area and I counted, we have I think 54 trees and 96 shrubs because I planted a bunch after. Yeah, back. we cleaned that all out. Your, your parents were here, yeah, your dad. dad helped out with yeah. uh, pulling all the roots out. We pulled so many roots. Every time we're like, we're done. And we walk in there and you stumble over something. It's like, guess what? It's another root. 
And, and we, uh, you had mowed that area in advance and that's an area where we're also going to be putting a future greenhouse. And that was one of the examples that we were going to prioritize that greenhouse even before the meadow house. We were gonna prioritize that and that became like priority like Z <laughs> down at the bottom. You, you created like these triangles for it to kind of map out where it would be. Yeah, and, the space is mapped out for it, but. And, and, and yeah, so we have that and we've like planted around, uh, around that, which is really great because now that area that we call the interstitial area between the meadow and the forest, we have a lot of uh, fruit and nut bearing trees. A lot of them are native and would also provide some really beautiful flowers. So we'd imagine as people are coming up the driveway, there'll be a lot of beautiful flowering trees and a lot of trees that will provide wildlife value as well. So that was a big, a big project. And then uh, we planted up some raised beds. We did two raised beds with asparagus. I also put in elecampane and uh, I think I planted Jerusalem artichoke in there too, because these are things that really kind of are bullies and they kind of push out and it's so hard to get rid of them once they're actually planted. So decided to actually plant those in raised beds. And I might do the same with like garlic and things along those lines. Although I did put like some wild garlic and alliums like in the orchard. Uh, so that was something that we did, just two quick raised beds around the, the chicken coop. And then, oh, well, we also landscaped the area around the meadow house. While you were renovating, doing a lot of the renovations, I started doing the landscaping around the meadow house and we did half of the meadow house and my gosh doesn't that look so different it's so yeah, beautiful. it looks great yeah it's mo much more beautiful less weedy and then there's another s si side of it that we're planning maybe to put a rock garden and that got punted until next year it's just too much work um with too little yeah now summer. we know what stones cost <laughs> but we have a lot of old stones and leftover stones here. be good We'll so, take all the leftover stones yeah. and throw those in there. Although I really like, would like a big honking stone, like the ones we saw at the, we'll see, we'll see. And then uh, I think that's, you know, about it. I mentioned the removing the lawn in the front and we put in a front garden. That was one of the last big gardens that we put in. Yeah. Yeah. And obviously all of this takes a lot of investment and a lot of time. And we each have our own job and what I'll often do is I'll take on a client project, but I'll end up working on that at night. And then during the day, we'll do more work here on the property. So it's kind of just like a full-time thing. I'm here full-time, you're kind of half-time. I'm half-time. So, time. you know, it's like, it, we make it work. And then, yeah. It's but can we cost... imagine, can we imagine when we're all here and we could all contribute, you know, more so? Because one of the things, well, yeah. One of the things that's nice about some of our client work is oftentimes, not all the time, but oftentimes we could be a bit more malleable with when we work on things because we're in the kind of the creative space. Well, everything is remote work. And it's mainly remote work. And in some cases, like we took on a client recently, the two of us, and it had to be on these specific days and we had to actually travel to go there and all that other kind of stuff. And so those are designated uh, time frames, but which also acts as inspiration. Like now yeah. we're going to another place to film and get to see someone else's setup. Up and we went to know. the a local nursery. Uh, you, can you can bring, <laughs> you can bring, uh, you know, you can visit other places to yeah. go get plants or yeah. make. You know, we often repurpose those trips. Like we go somewhere, and then what else can we pick up along the way? Yeah. And yeah, it takes a lot of investment too, but we. We decided to do a lot of the work ourselves plus contractors because we were just not able to you know afford like renovating this whole place by like a proper company and if you do the work yourself yes it's going to take a lot longer it's going to take a lot of your own time you have to learn how to do a lot of things but eventually i think this is for us the right route to go yeah uh, because we can dedicate that time well, I was even thinking that like, even if we, even if we hired somebody, um, we'd still be there breathing down their neck, working with them. That's it's another thing. Like we also have a very, because we're all creative. We have this, we are very specific about how things look, how they're designed. And that maybe some other people don't have. That's more like functionality aspect for them and they're fine with how it looks. 
but we have a very specific like oh it's got to be the right height for us to sit on like this right. and it has it has to have the right proportions as far as like garden bed versus like and it's got to be placed exactly here because then when you look at it then you see a little bit of this garden bed sticking out from the other one like there's just so many details that we care about it would be just hard to hire that out to anyone else and then yeah it we do annoy some of the freelance contractors that we oh, work with <laughs> But, but but we like it. I mean, it's we care about it so much, and you're going to be living with it for the rest of your life. Like this, we always want to feel like you know, beauty and functionality for us go hand in hand. I inter integrate my fingers, but I'm wearing mittens. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, so I think it, I think it's really important that we do the things that we love, and you know, just as we're expressive you know, through the work that we do creatively on the computer, whatever, and video, um, you know, hopefully that, you know, results in the same way that we, we work on the, the land as yeah. well. And it's not su such a bad thing that it happens slow, slower over time because yeah. our investment, instead of having to put a lot of money in at the same at one time to get something done by someone else in a shorter time, now it gets spread out over time and you can kind of just like every month contribute up until the amount that we need to renovate the entire place yeah. and that's kind of like one of the strategies that we also been applying and one of the you know kind of the the, the things that are is probably the most boring but you have to do it and we do it is just really understanding what amount of time and money so your own time and your own money um, that you're putting into a project and mapping that out and knowing what it is for each, for accounting purposes, one, but also knowing and budgeting, what do we want to do for this project? What is that project going to cost us? And so we've actually, all these different projects that we mentioned, they all are different projects here that we've recorded. It's not like this is what we've spent on all of it. No, it has to be very granular. Um, and yeah, so, and some so of the things make more sense to, to hire out because, for, for example, electric. For me to learn how to do electric work and make sure it passes all the safety and the code, that's just not worth it for the amount of work that needs to get done here as far as electric. We got to wire up, you know, three homes here and then it's done. Like. I, I rather hire someone to come in and knock that out for two days and pay that person because for me to have to learn how to do that and then yeah it's not going to save me any time yeah so so that's what we've been able to really accomplish for the next uh the last two years and you know hopefully now that you know joey and, and Kia are back and we're going to be finishing the meadow house and we'll have places for everyone to stay i'm assuming that they're going to actually contribute a lot more and and i'm going to be here you know, probably still 50%, but I think we could get the bulk of what we are aiming to do done within the next two years, I think, personally. I don't know what you think. I hope so. I set a goal that, and we'll see how this goes in the end of next year, but by the end of next year, I'd like to have most of the renovations in a good place. Hopefully, by the end of this year, we can finish the meadow house and the workshop. Then, Next year, we can focus all year on renovating the main building, which is the biggest beast. And if we can do that, then there's little things to do, like, you know, some of the outside things like deck replacement, like some landscaping, some paths here yeah. and there. Roof. And then if we can get to that place, oh yeah, and the roof needs to be replaced as well. So if we can get that in control, then yeah, say two years, because I'm thinking a year, <laughs> And then it usually takes double the amount of time anyways. Yeah, two years. So. Two years. <laughs> I'm trying to put fingers up in my On to another two years. Yeah, absolutely. All right, now we're going to get to renovating the meadow house. So, got to get working. Cool. <laughs>